I'm actually going to begin by having us do a little multitasking, which is going to be also somewhat of the sense of my talk. So the multitasking, I ask you please to all stand up. You've been sitting so patiently, we're going to get a little movement here and stretching. And now that you are all standing up, I would like you to join me in thanking Rachel McKenzie Hudson and Dennis for putting on such an astounding <laughs> so by our multitasking, we have just created a standing ovation. You can all sit now. <laughs> and a lot of what I have to say you will recognize because it really does revive themes that we've heard throughout a lot of the talks today. At certain points today, I thought it would be totally redundant for me to stand up here in front of you because everything I had to say in some way or another has been said by so many of our speakers. But let's try to use this in a sense as a summing up. And in the classic humanities way, it's going to be a summing up that tries to take a look at the big picture. So if we're going to start with the big picture, we should start with the biggest picture of all. And so I want to talk about creativity today. And every culture tells itself stories about how it got there. It, every culture has a creation myth. And the creation myth is, yes, a story about how we got here. But it's also the model, the paradigm, for how that culture thinks about creativity. And if we want to think about in the Western tradition, we have a number of creation myths. But probably the most powerful one is the one that comes down to us from the Bible, from the book of Genesis. And of course, this is Michelangelo's presentation of God's creation of Adam. But I actually want to go back to the first book of Genesis. God's creation of Adam actually occurs in the third book. In the first book of Genesis, we have a different figure, a different creator God. And you'll remember that one. He's a figure who sits there by himself, dreams up an idea, and then says, let there be light. And what he dreams up becomes a reality. And then that God does something else. He begins to organize the chaos. He begins to divide things. He takes the light and separates it from the darkness. He takes the night and separates it from the day. He takes the sea and separates it from the land. A place for everything and everything in its place. And the other thing we learned in this creation story is that creation is hard work. God gets to have a rest at the end of the week. Um, but when we think about this God, we might begin to think maybe this is a model of divine creation, but perhaps not such a good model or a good way to think about human creation. And one of the first critics to think about it in those terms was Blake, the romantic poet. And when Blake thought about that God in Genesis, he worried about this act of separation. He worried about this drawing of boundaries the putting of everything in its place. For Blake, chaos is fertile. Purity is sterile. He wanted the chaos of things mixing, the diversity that Jody Simone spoke about earlier today, where the creativity comes precisely from the collision of things, not from the keeping of them separate. And so when Blake went to picture the God of the, of the Old Testament, he pictured him with this compass, dividing things, drawing lines. And Blake thought that was the wrong way to go. So another place to go in our tradition for an alternative vision of creativity, and one that maybe is better suited for human creativity, is Aristotle. And Aristotle in the Poetics says that the ability to create metaphors cannot be acquired from someone else and is an indication of genius. And I want to follow through in my talk today what metaphor means, and if we think about metaphor, how that gives us a model of creation that might pr prove more useful for us. So what is a metaphor? A metaphor is a figurative expression in which a word or concept is shifted from its normal uses to a context in which it evokes new meanings or generates new ideas. And I want to hold on to this idea of the generative, of that which is productive. And the idea that's the crossing of boundaries, the moving from one context to another, the taking something from its rightful place and using it in a place where it completely transforms what it's supposed to be. So I took you, I stood you up so I could get your circulation going. I could have you alive for my presentation. 
and then I turned you into an audience giving someone a standing ovation. We moved you from one context to another. Something got changed in the process. And one of the ways of trying to think about how this might be a better model for human creation is to go back and think about that God in Genesis. That God in Genesis has no partner, no collaborator, no spouse. And if we think about creativity on the human level, probably the best model and metaphor we have for human creativity is the production of new life. And the production of new life, as we well know, it takes two to tango. And not only that, this is a really neat feature. It's a lot of fun, too. <laughs> so I want to think about this idea of the collision and the ways that we bring things across boundaries. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I found Steve Johnson's book really uh, inspiring on this topic, so I recommend it to you, but I'm not going to read the slide. Instead, I'm going to move us right to James Joyce. And what was the generative idea behind James Joyce's Ulysses, often thought of as the greatest work of literature of the 20th century? Joyce took the mythic story of Ulysses, of Odysseus, the great hero from the Greek epic, and he matched it, he combined it, he made, infused it into the ordinary daily life of a Dublin schlub. Someone walking around the city for one day in Dublin. Dear, dirty Dublin, as Joyce liked to think about it. And what Joyce did with this was a transfiguration of the ordinary. He took the ordinary and made it extraordinary. But in a way, I want to insist, was not to devalue the ordinary, not to say that the ordinary doesn't count for anything only if it's extraordinary, but rather to make us pay attention, to focus in on precisely what is extraordinary in the things that we take for granted in our daily routines. So what Joyce was able to do was say, just shift the context. Distance yourself enough to think about Leopold Bloom as a modern day Ulysses, and all of a sudden our world is opened up to us in entirely different ways. And I love this picture of the Joyce statue in Dublin. Why? Because here's Joyce the walker, and Joyce saw, thought of walking through a city, a diverse, lively environment as a way to get flooded with changes of context, diverse views. And here's Joyce, of course, as a statue. Now he's stopped. He can't perambulate any longer. But the people in the city are walking by. And here's Joyce, the extraordinary artist, up on a pedestal. But the pedestal is repurposed. It's a place for a tired walker to sit and stop and rest with her back conspicuously turned to Joyce. I would, I would hope that Joyce would love this picture as an image of him re-immersed back in to the daily life of the Dublin that he both, it's true, loved and hated. Um, so I want to give you another example of a kind of repurposing, a moving across um, from one context to another. And it's a very simple idea when you think about it, but you th it was an astoundingly transformative idea. We had these things called computers. They existed in the 1940s and 1950s. And there are two things that needed to happen to make computers change, to repurpose computers. Because computers in the 40s and 50s were used for large-scale computational in the military and the banks and insurance companies. And there weren't, they weren't something that were part of everyday life to keep this theme of the ordinary. They weren't part of our ordinary existence. And why weren't they part of our ordinary existence? Because let's face it, most of the people in the room, I assume are like me, we haven't the slightest chance of understanding how a computer works and how it does what it does. So that there had to be some way to create what those began to think of as an interface, a way in which the ordinary user could actually make sense of what a computer does and what a computer could do for him or for her. And someone, and it's great about this too in terms of the way I'm thinking about creativity, someone or some group of someones, it's lost in the midst of time. It probably happened at Hewlett Packard, had the idea, and it maybe came from our cliche about the eyes being the window of the soul, of saying we need a window into the computer. What we need to do is have a way for human users to see into the computer, to visualize what's happening in the soul of that machine. 
And the result was a computer on every desk and eventually a computer in every pocket. Now, I did say there were two things necessary. This is a great transformative moment. They also had to make the units small enough so you could fit them in your pocket. I mean, there had to be a technological breakthrough as well. But what I love about this was that even the window and the metaphor of the window was a redescription of a problem. Here was a problem we were facing. How do we get people to use these things? And it redescribed, it didn't solve the problem, but it gave you a whole new set of terrain on which to approach the problem and think about the possible solutions. So obviously I want to stress this idea that if we yank things out of their context, if we bring them across, that we can um, make progress on various ideas. Now let's go back to Aristotle for a moment. You might remember in the quote that I gave us from Aristotle, Aristotle says this can't be taught. You're simply born, it's, he seemed to think you were simply born with an innate capacity to think metaphorically. I'm a teacher, I'm not gonna stand there and be passive with Aristotle, I might as well give up if that's the truth. So I wanna think about what kind of things can we do to promote this ability to think metaphorically. And there's two things in particular I wanna to mention to you today. The first is simply the notion of, as one of my earlier slides said, of keep moving. That it's really crucially important to move from context to context. And in lots of things in life, I think, and as a rule of thumb, not as a scientific law of any kind, it's productive to think in 80-20s. And 80-20 rules are great rules of thumb for how to think about how to approach various kinds of things. And what I want to suggest here is that, yes, you have to become an expert in something. Yes, you have to know a lot about the thing that you're trying to accomplish in order to make progress. But in fact, if you devote 100% of your time, you're probably less likely to have, be successful than if you follow an 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule is to say 20% of your time should in some way be self-indulgence. The following a passion, having a hobby, having a side interest, something that's on the back burner. Because it's precisely the intersection between those different interests. So do spread yourself thin a bit. Don't burrow in entirely into one discipline or one pursuit. And so I love the fact, when I think of this keep moving, I love the fact that the NASA uh, land rover sent to Mars is called Curiosity. So I'm here to tell you to indulge your curiosity. And I'm, you know, there are times when I think, how the hell can the United States, which has 21.4% child poverty, be spending millions on NASA? And then I think, yeah, but we gotta remember about this indulgence of curiosity and the benefits that it brings too. That's a tough one for me, but I think one, I can see arguments on both sides, I guess I wanna say. The other thing I wanna just mention and spend a little less time on this, even though I've got a million slides on it because I'd talk all afternoon if I didn't curb myself, is that I think the important thing here is to create the environments that can stimulate creative thinking and innovation. And Holden touched on this right at the beginning this morning, and Jody Simone's talk certainly went in this direction also, that the university is a certain kind of environment. There are other kinds of environments for other kinds of purposes, but I'm especially attached to the university, obviously because I work in one, but also because I think we're at a moment when the value of the university is under siege when people don't recognize the extent to which universities really are the engines of innovation that uh, Holden and Buck Goldstein say, say they are in their book. And those of you who know me even know I'm obsessed with politics and I can go off into a whole political riff about this, but I will spare you that and just touch a few points fairly quickly. So that's, I just like this picture because it's the idea of the bounded self trapped into a workspace that's not going to create these connections across lines. And rather instead, we do have obviously lots of people now thinking physically about the kind of spaces that do promote connections across boundaries and creativity. Um, but there's a politics of creativity, and one of them is this, you have the God who thinks, you know, the heroic individual God of the first book of Genesis who creates something he imagines all by himself, or the notion of collective enterprises as being collective, as, as being creative. And that then those lead to very different political conclusions in terms of what you should be doing within your society to foster creativity and productivity. Um, and as I say, I'm not gonna go all through all those, but I love this slide, it's called the Research Triangle, wonderfully enough, 
uh, where we say. But what it suggests is it's not that there's not going to be some people who are heroic, individual, creative, cre creative people, but that there are different models of creativity. And I love this because also it suggests in our new dis dispensation, machines are also uh, contributors uh, to our creativity, to our productivity. But that there has to be a way in which these things are brought together and the strengths of the different approaches uh, work together synergistically, not separately. And then I, I could go on and on about the myth of risk. I think people are creative when they're in secure environments, safe environments, where they're not risking their livelihoods or the, the respect <coughs> of other people. Um, and then also, as Dan Arley was talking about, we have a real problem in terms of time frames now, where we want instant returns of our investments, and it's becoming harder and harder for us as a society to invest in something like the university, where research has much longer time frames, and where the obvious economic benefits of the research are not going to appear tomorrow. And, and maybe, in some cases, never. That gets back to the failure. You have to have lots of failures to go along with the uh, successes. Um, but I want to get back, finally, to closing in talking about the person, the people who are creative. And I love this quote from Henry James, the writer aspires to be someone on whom nothing is lost. So one thing about being creative is being attentive. Be open to the world. See what's out there. Walk through the city and let it wash through you. And we do this, of course, in a liberal arts education. We do this when we ask you to go abroad. We do this when we ask you to, re to learn another language. Step outside of your culture. Step outside of your discipline. Step outside of your country. Expose yourself to all kinds of different experiences, all kinds of different people. But also, I think the, the James quote points us to a basic generosity. I think that one of the problems about the time frames and the worry about invest, return on investment is that we've lost the sense that the person who gives the most is the person who gets the most. That kind of radical openness has its returns uh, in what happens in the experiences and the vitality of the creativity that it leads us to. And so that leads me to the final point I want to make, which is that why? Why do we worry about creativity? Why do we want to be creative? What's so great about being creative? And I think it really comes down to the fact that each and every one of us wants to have made a difference in the world. Each and every one of us wants to leave an impress somewhere in the world on something, some place, or some person. And creativity is really about meaning about having a meaningful life. And I want to go back to Aristotle here, because I think Aristotle points us to something really crucial, which is that meanings are always about relationships, about creating relationships. A meaning is not created until two things are put in relation to one another. And we can do this on the simplest level. D-O-G, there's a set of letters. They have to be related to a sound, the sound being dog. And that sound has to be related to that little furry pet you have at home. The relationship is what creates the meaning. And creativity is precisely the place where people create the relationships, make the relationships that make their lives significant. And if there's any lesson I would want you to take away from today's TED meeting, from these inspiring talks that we've heard, is to go out into the world and make something happen. And so I doing, I'm doing this in a somewhat negative way, which is to say my following slide is going to show you what will happen if today has not been a success. There will be a plaque like this put on the FedEx building next year if nothing comes of today. Thank you.